So welcome to Scrapbook Live. Today is February 28th and I am Megan Jacks. And today we are going to be what, are talking about the Creative Memories of Border Maker System and the Picket Fence Border Maker Cartridge. So um, I know many of you are experienced Creative Memories Scrapbookers, so you're very familiar with the Border Maker System. It's a pretty diverse tool. You may have dozens of Border Maker cartridges, but the one cartridge that almost everybody has, because it comes with the actual system itself, is the, the Picket Fence. And this is what Picket Fence looks like, if I can get this highlighted in there. The backside, you can see that pattern. And the Border Maker System, it comes with three parts. We have our paper holder, and then we have our cartridge holder. So I'll talk more about these. I'm gonna kind of run you through a few of the basics of the border maker system. And then we're gonna talk about how you can use the border maker, especially the picket fence in a little bit different ways, because I think sometimes we have a tendency to look at this pattern and we sometimes think, oh, that's all it can do. Well, there's actually a few techniques that you can do to give it a different look so that you can use it in a few more ways, which is actually a great approach for any of the border maker cartridges to figure out how to use them in other ways. I know there's tons of creativity out there. There's a lot of people, advisors, who do share various ways to use the various border maker cartridges. Um, but I thought today we'd talk about picket fence because I know everyone theoretically should have picket fence. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn over to my overhead camera and we'll get started. All right, so the first, I can tell you the first project we're gonna dive into is the one I called a fold and punch picket frame. Um, I'm gonna move this to the side for just a second because I want to talk about a couple things about the border maker system before we jump into the actual projects. Just in case we have new people on here or to kind of review a few of the terms and things we talk about. I mentioned that we have the border, or excuse me, the paper holder. It has a tray that slides out from under and we use this tray to help us align paper. So here I just have some blue cardstock. You can see I pull the tray out. I line my paper up flush within that tray. Our cardstock sometimes is a little bit longer. You're gonna see when I close down the lighter blue portion, there's a magnet in there that holds everything in place. I have a little bit of a curl because my blue paper is about 12 and 1 8 inch. So that's okay, I can trim that off later. Uh, but you can see here, I've got it flush within that tray to that outside edge. I then pull that tray back, it cl clicks under place there, and then I'll be able to work my um, border maker cartridge along the edge. So to do that, you take your, uh, this is the cartridge holder, you have your cartridge. You'll see here we have some metal uh, teeth. See those metal teeth? Well, if I can focus, there they go. Those will come to the outside so you can see the pattern here. That's to the front. It slides in and then it should kind of lock into place. My border maker system is several years old and has plenty of wear and tear on it. So every once in a while to just make sure it clicks into place. And then what you do is there are six, what I call slots. I actually have them numbered on my thing here and they line up with these, these little teeth that stick out, the plastic teeth along that lighter blue um, magnetic closure. And I want you to note on here on your BMC, on the cartridge holder, you also have a little metal or a plastic guide. To give you a roundabout way that that, those two things should line up and when you get it in there, you can kind of wiggle around and there it slid into place because on the back side, let's take a look what it looks like on the underside. You see those metal teeth? They're gonna fit in to those notches. And then we know we're locked into place. Whenever you're using the border maker cartridge, I like to go ahead and always keep a little pressure, kind of pushing the two things together. You don't have to use a lot of pressure, but you wanna keep them nice and kind of um, firmly together because that's gonna make sure you have a very even cut all the way down rather than having, you know, being a little loose and having a 16th of an inch difference. Sometimes you'll note that in the pattern when you're going down the line. But when you use it, you just go ahead. I use the, my palm and push down. You may find that you have to stand up to do this. It really depends on how strong your grip is. 
And you can see I am just working my way down and making sure I'm in the slot, keeping that pressure, keeping those two pieces together and pushing down the line. And there we go. You can see now I've got my picket fence punched. Picket fence is an edge style border maker cartridge. So let's talk about that briefly. An edge style border maker cartridge, you can see here I have punched the outside edge and I have altered that edge. Here's what it punches. If I put this back on top, then you'll start to see my original straight edge of my border. So an edge style is going to alter the edge, but stay attached to the body of your paper. Another edge style border maker cartridge that is currently available is Notebook Edge. If there we go, you can see Notebook Edge stays attached to the paper, but gives you that um, spiral bound notebook edge as if you've torn the paper out of the notebook. Uh, to compare an edge style to um, something different, there is another style called a knockout style, which does not alter the outside edge of your paper. Whatever your edge is, here you can see I've actually used the decorative blade. I use the wave blade to, well, it's not gonna focus, but I use the wave blade to cut that edge. You can see it's kind of wavy. I can punch that with, this is Zebra Stripe BMC. I can punch that with my border maker cartridge and it's actually gonna keep that wavy edge. So again, I flipped out my the, the smoky colored, um, paper tray. I've lined up. I've got that edge flush in that paper tray all the way to that edge. I'm going to swap my cartridge out. To swap the cartridge, you will push the button on the back and it doesn't pop out. You can see I'm going to push the cartridge and it doesn't do anything. All it's doing is moving down a lever that keeps things in place, but it doesn't actually push it out. And then I just tip it over into my hand. Sometimes I have to like give it a little bit of a, you know, help it out a little bit, but all you do is press that button, tip it into your palm and it should come out. Now I've swapped out. I've got zebra car cartridge in there now. Again, this is a knockout style, meaning it's not gonna alter the edge. It's gonna punch that pattern in here. Other ones that are similar to this are confetti. If you have some of the older ones are bubbles, um, flip-flops, there's a whole bunch of them that are the knockout style. But here you can see all I've done is punched out a bunch of these little, I don't know, confetti type pieces. But what you see here is that scallop edge or the wave edge that I had previously cut with my trimmer is still intact. So that's a great thing about edge style, or excuse me, knockout style. You can use that decorative edge or decorative um, blades for your trimmer. You can tear it. You can do whatever you want prior to punching and you'll be able to have a fun decorative edge there. Or you can leave it straight. Now, edge style, the, the third style of border maker cartridge, because remember we've talked about edge style, which is something like picket fence. We talked about knockout style, which is something like zebra stripe. The other style is chain style. Chain style is gonna be something here. You can see I am cutting the top and the bottom. It's gonna remove completely from my body of paper. These two, the edge style and the knockout style, they've stayed attached to the body of my paper. Now, chain will not. It's gonna come away from my paper when I punch it. However, these two, knockout and edge, can become chains by using the trimmer. So we would just use the trimmer. I can give it a cut if I want this to be, I've already cut with the wave, maybe I wanna use the wave again to cut the other side. Generally, it's about an inch and an eighth is gonna give you on the knockout style. So now I've got zebra stripe with waves at the top and the bottom. For the uh, picket fence, I would come back in probably just with my straight blade and give it a cut wherever you, however deep you want it. If you want to have more space down here, you can have more space. If you want this truly to just be a chain that's just those fence pieces, again, coming out about to an inth, inch and in one eighth at the tip of those pickets. And there we have, we've turned those edge and knockout styles into chains. So when people are talking about a chain style border, 
you know you can make one with the other styles of um, border cartridges, you're just gonna have to use your trimmer to cut it away from the body of the paper. Now, let's take a peek at this. This is a Snowflake Circle BMC. And I'll just show you the difference. They all start the same way using the paper holder. And here you can see, see it's floppy, it's pulling away, it's, it's being separated from the body of the paper. So there you can see. When it says chain in the name of the border maker cartridge, you know it's going to separate from the paper. It's not going to stay attached. So we have a true chain style, we have an edge style, and then we have our knockout style border maker cartridges. Those are the three types of border maker cartridges that um, we'll refer to. And we usually refer to those because we want you to be able to decide other cartridges you may have that work with your layout, your theme, your photos, whatever. So whenever I say, oh, you're gonna need a chain style BMC, really what I'm looking for is something that's gonna be like this. It's gonna just be broken away pieces. You don't need the rest of the body of the paper with it. Um, if you need an edge style, you're gonna wanna have that decorative edge. And sometimes with the knockout style, the reason I suggested knockout is because it's gonna have, um, it needs to stay attached to the paper. Um, there's been various things we've done within Power Hour that we definitely want that edge to be preserved. We just want the design that will punch out along the edge. Okay, so now we're gonna talk more about picket fence and ways that we can use picket fence um, a little differently. Picket fence is pretty distinctive. It's got that pinking edge and it's got those, um, you know, the fence openings, I guess you could say. One of the big things with picket fence it will do um, that you're able to do is weave in and out a picket fence. You can take a piece of paper that is five eighths of an inch and weave in and out in various patterns. We will do that in our um, third project of the day. We're gonna do the weaving, we'll talk more about that. So just keep that in mind. Um, but the first project we're going to play around with, well, actually the first project will have some weaving in it, but it's not the five eighths inch. We're going to learn what happens when you fold your paper prior to putting it in the paper tray. Um, the technique that we're going to do um, works really well with picket fence, but it can be done with other border maker cartridges. I always suggest when you get a new cartridge, grab some scrap paper and just start playing around, fold the paper, um, figure out what types of things it can do. I don't recommend doing it with cardstock because cardstock, when you fold it, is really difficult. It's almost too much in the border in the um, for the border maker system to handle. But you can use regular paper, even use scrap eight and a half by eleven. You get a bill that you want to punch up. Just go ahead, fold it, play with it, figure it out how you um, what that cartridge can do. So, the first project is as I mentioned before, is the one that I call fold and punch picket frame. I had originally made it as part um, using the breast cancer awareness collection that we have. So, or we used to have, I, I maybe, I can't remember if this one is, is pink and powerful. I can't remember if it's still available on the website, but we are going to need to use, we need a back, a base piece of paper. In this layout, the sample layout, it is the diagonal striped pink, black, and white paper. For my example layout, I am going to be playing with the um, National Scrapbook Day papers, but of course you can play with anything you want. I was hoping that maybe my spring papers would be here, but UPS has not shown up today so far. They're coming, they're supposed to be coming at some point. But I wanted something, you know, bright and airy, thinking those hopeful springtime thoughts. My base piece of paper is going to be the cone flower. It's kind of that light blue periwinkled color. That's my base paper. We will be folding and punching that. Then you're also going to want to have another piece of paper. It could be cardstock that you'll be weaving in and out of those folded punch um, outer edges to make our frame. I am going to be trimming some paper from the green bark color. These are these two pieces are out of the actual project recipe kit for National Scrapbook Day. 
And then you also are gonna want um, a piece of paper that you will trim down in the sample. You can see it was the pink color, the pink card stock. I am not, I think I'm going to use for that, I'm gonna use some Starry Night Shimmer. I think that works really pretty with the, they both, both of these blues have a little bit of the uh, purple undertone to them as compared to coming in with the, the blue cardstock. You can see there's just, I liked the purple. And of course, who doesn't love a little bit of shimmer, right? So it's use the shimmer in there. And then if I want to with the mats, um, in my sample, I have some black mats. I give the directions on the sizes for those. I could come in if I want to bring in that uh, tangerine peachy color. I really love the softer tones of the uh, gingham that's in the project recipe kit as compared to using the actual tangerine. Um, tangerine was, is, 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 it's a big, it, um, it's an intense color, uh, but I think this soft, the softer um, peachy color in the kit is a nice option. So I'm gonna have everything, I'm gonna use just my background paper for now. I mentioned it was this periwinkle cone flower paper. And you, it, for what we're gonna wanna do here too, you are gonna want, if you have your scoring blade for your trimmer, of course you're gonna need your border maker system and picket fence. And we're gonna use our scoring blade and we're gonna score at one inch all the way around. Um, and so um, that's, that's gonna be our, our the, the technique part here is just, just using the scoring blade all the way around. If you do not have the scoring blade, if you do not have the scoring blade and you have the rotary trimmer, I suggest putting the scoring blade on your wish list. Pick it up with your next order. There is free shipping right now if you, um, for $80 or more. Uh, that's U.S. prices. It's a little more in Canada. But um, the scoring blade is pretty fantastic. If you do not have the scoring blade, you can use your um, multi-purpose tool and a ruler on your cutting mat. You could also do it on a piece of the, uh, chipboard, like that comes the, the cardboard that comes with our, uh, card stock. And you would just run this edge, this point of your, um, multi-purpose tool down one inch all the way around. All right. I, I do see a comment asking about the handouts. These handouts are all on my website. There is a link um, somewhere, but if you go to meganjacks.com and then go to Scrapbook Live, you'll see it. It's the very first one right there for February 28th. So I'm gonna use my, uh, I'm gonna use my trimmer here to do this. I'm gonna switch over to my scoring blade. The one thing I do wanna um, remind you, if you're using your scoring blade on your trimmer, I want you to check your um, your grooves here before you get going. The reason is, is if you have a really worn cut um, cut groove, I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Is, these are the sides one and two. No, it's not wanting to focus in. Come on, camera. Well, sides one and two on my, um, my cutting mat are definitely worn. I flipped over. I'm actually using side four. I just switched it over. Um, last week. So I think I'm good. But if you have a really worn groove, you're going to not want to use it with your scoring blade because there is a potential that you'll actually cut your paper. You want to have a relatively um, fresh edge on your uh, trimmer. Now, if you're unsure and you're like not sure and you don't want to risk it, what you can do is go ahead and just switch over to a clean edge. Like if you're on edge three, go ahead and switch over to four. You could always just tell yourself, I'm going to score on four and you always just switch over to four before you score. And that way you don't have to worry about it cutting through, assuming four hasn't been used yet. Um, my four, I've used it, but I haven't used it that much. So I should be good. So I'm going to go ahead and line up here at one inch and I will score. There we go. Yep, one inch from all sides. The scoring blade does make it super easy 
One last one to do. And I'm gonna set my trimmer to the side for a minute. So that now that we have scored all four sides, we're gonna go ahead and fold one of those sides. You do not necessarily need to like crease it super, super tight. You just wanna get it folded. Now we're gonna feed that folded edge into our paper trimmer or the, the paper holder. Now, the one thing I want you to know is before I do that, I want you to, I want to point out, see this middle line, that ridge? It's a, uh, on the back side. if you look at it, you can see they just got some stabilization, um, extra built-in areas to stabilize the paper tray. We're gonna use those um, manufacturing aspects to help guide us with this. So I want you to line it up with this, what appears to be just a dark black line. And your goal is you wanna make sure that you either, um, you tell yourself, do I wanna overlap it completely? Do I wanna go right up to the edge of the black line? But whatever you do, you want it to be as even as possible down the edge. So I like to line mine up right at the start of that black. So I can actually see the entire black line all the way up and I'm gonna move my paper. I'm gonna adjust it here, I'm gonna pull it to get everything lined up as evenly as possible. If you have any kind of a tilt to your paper, so if I'm like, if I was covering the line, that black line up here, but still able to see the line at the top, the, the sections that I punch are gonna be a little bit uneven, meaning they would be a little bit um, narrower at the top and a little wider at the bottom. I want them to be as even as possible so that this is definitely an area to take the time, make sure you get things lined up. Pull this back. I need to put my cartridge back in my cartridge holder and then I'm gonna punch. Oops, and I made a mistake right away. Don't don't start punching. On my handout, you'll see, I am not going to punch in the top and the bottom. So my handout was made before I started numbering the slots. Uh, this is an older handout from a couple of years ago. So I actually have my slots numbered one, two, three, four, five, six down the line. You are not punching in slots one and six. You're gonna punch in two, three, four, and five. On my handout, I mentioned you're punching four times, not at the top and not at the bottom, okay? So I made a mistake, I'm not worried about it. Um, there's ways to cover it up. So you're gonna punch in two, three, four, and five. And then you're gonna rotate your paper, fold and punch again. And you're just gonna do this all the way around. Now, because I punched that end, I just have to work a little harder to get that folded right. And we're just gonna keep working our way all the way around. Lining it up the same way, taking your time to get that lined up. You can actually, I find it uh, to go ahead and close the magnetic closure. And then I can kind of wiggle it a little bit to get it where I want it lined up. I'm not punching at the top. I'm gonna come down one slot. So slot two, three, four, and five. Now you could expand this into a two page layout if you wanted to. You would basically only do three sides and on the side that comes to the middle, you would actually punch all the way to the ends on those. Um, that is a variation if you, if you are a person who prefers to always have two page layout options.
And again, skipping the first slot, punching the next four, skipping the bottom, one more round, one more side to do. And here we go. Last time. So here we go. Aside from my little boo-boo up there, you can see here that we've got ourselves a nice frame made. You do have two inch squares in the corner that you have the ability to, um, in my sample, you, you weave the things in and then you overlap the ends with the ribbon cuts. You could, instead of, um, you could still weave in here, but instead of having those ribbon cuts in the end, you could come in with like the, uh, the square punch, the circle punch, something here in the corners to play with. So the next step in here, we've done all the way through step four. Uh, four, we've done all the sides. So step five, we need to use a ruler because we need to measure before we start cutting. These should be roughly one inch wide, but I want you to measure before you start cutting. All right. So we're going to go ahead and come in here and I see that I'm actually like a one and one sixteenth at the bottom and up at the top. I am about one and I'm just a little shy of one and one sixteenth. I'm going to tell you right now, because of the way we put this in the cartridge or the system, it is going to be almost impossible for you to have it be perfectly matched at the top and the bottom. Um, so what I want you to do is measure the top and the bottom and then whichever number is the smaller. So I'm going to go with just one inch here, maybe a slightly over one inch. Um, but for this section right here, I'm going to start with the one inch. I am using that, I mentioned that kind of that wood grain, uh, it's kind of that mossy green color. I'm gonna cut this at one inch. I'm pushing it just a little bit past an inch, just an inch. I don't wanna go all the way to one and six, one sixteenth because my top's opening is not wide enough for that. And then what we'll do is we'll start weaving in and you can do whatever weave pattern you want. I am gonna leave I want to make sure that I have a flap hanging out. So I'm going to start from the top and I am going to just do over under. Now I probably could have been a little bit more generous on this. I do have a little bit of spacing that I can see on either side. Um, I might choose to back this, put some strips behind it if I feel like those openings are too wide. I probably could have gone closer. I probably could have gone a little bit closer to that inch in 1 16th. But there's nothing better than, you know, cutting your paper and then realizing it's too big. Okay. So there's my first set. I'm going to rotate and I'm going to go ahead and check my necks closer to about an inch and a 16th. Same at the top. So this one, I'm going to, I'm going to trim this one just a little bit wider than an inch. I'm not going to go to all that 16th. I'm probably going to an one and one thirty second. Those are kind of crazy numbers. Again, starting at the top and weaving under and over and under. And the here, I do feel like I have a better coverage of those openings. So a little bit more than one inch is good. And you just keep working your way. And you are gonna wanna do all four sides.
So um, I see Belinda asking about, do I always line the paper to just where the line is when cutting? This, this is the nuance of using any kind of a trimmer. It really doesn't matter because, you know, that line that says four inches is like a 32nd of an inch. So you can, depending on where you um, put things, it can impact your uh, sizing. So you kind of have to just tell yourself, where do you measure all the time? Do you go right up to the line? Do you cover the line? Um, I will admit I'm not super consistent. A lot of times I feel like I cover the line, um, but that's just kind of, you know, kind of how you have to figure it out. Um, I probably would need to play around with it a little bit more to know whether or not can you, if you go up to the four inch line, you see the four inch line is kind of thick compared to some of these other lines. So do you cover it up? Do you go right up to it so you can see the entire line? Do you cover it halfway up? Um, those are a little bit of nuanced things um, that maybe do and do not matter depending on how precise you are. I am not going to take the time to go all the way all four sides on this, largely because um, we're already... Um, I wanted to make sure we can get onto the next two projects. The other two sides, you do the exact same way. You can start to see how all your corners are going to be. You could leave this as such. You could come in and I do not have, I did not bring upstairs my uh, circle and square punches. You can come here in the corner and just put an embellishment. You can ribbon cut these. The thing to know is if you ribbon cut these, you've got to do a very shallow ribbon cut. I'm going to lift this up. I should be able to, I think, fold it still. And I am not going to come up anymore. I do not want to come up any higher on my back edge that the, the inset of my ribbon any more than like a half an inch. I want to come up like a quarter of an inch here. You can see I've got to make sure that I can see the, um, I don't make it any wider than this or any deeper. So I'm going to come in here. And I am going to make a really shallow, maybe, ribbon cut. And you can see there, I did not come up very high at all. See, it's very, just enough to give that, um, give that effect that it's a ribbon cut. And then I'll repeat it on the other side. You could ribbon cut these before you insert, but I don't know. I haven't tried to feed a ribbon cut through like that. Again, just doing a very, very shallow ribbon cut, just enough to give it that effect. And then what you'll do to lock these into place is you really just need to put some adhesive on the end. So whatever side you want to be the bottom, I'm gonna go ahead, grab just regular adhesive, put some on here, put that into place. You can, if you feel like you really need to get those ribbon ends, come in there, put some adhesive, some repositionable adhesive on there and tack those down. And then the other one comes on top. Slide this down. Those, the ends of the ribbons come all the way to the edge of the paper because we are using a full 12 inch strip here. Just our ribbon ends are cut. So you would repeat that all the way around. Now in the middle, after you've got all of your, um, everything done here, you're gonna go in with an eight and a half inch square. I think my eight and a half inch square, I'm gonna go ahead and trim it. Um, I'm gonna cut it with the wave blade. I'm going to set my edge. I've got to trim a little bit on two sides to make my edge. And then I'll bring out my trimmer and eight and a half. Now here's another one. When you have these decorative edges, you know, you're kind of like, where do I go? Do I go to the peak of the wave or do I go to the um, trough of the wave? Is that where I'm lining things up? And again, for this type of a thing, it doesn't matter too much. Um, I'm probably going to go on air on the side of a little larger and make sure that the, my eight and a half is down in that trough. 
So I'm going to cover up, I'm going to go till the, um, the peak of my wave is a little bit past the eight and a half. This is just going to give me a little bit more space, but to make a square, I just want to make sure I repeat. So if I use, if I went a little bit past to put that eight and a half inch line in the valley of my wave, I need to be consistent. So this will come in the middle as such. Next up, I would use, if I want to go ahead and use the gingham the, um, for my um, pieces, I could. This particular layout had uh, one four by six and two four by fours mats. Those are the mat sizes. I could just put my photos directly on here. I'm gonna switch over to my straight blade and I'm gonna cut a four by six and two four by fours mats. And then I would put on photos that are trimmed down a little bit from their original sizes. So here's a four by six. I'll keep this one still trimmed to a four by six and then I'll cut two four by fours from another. I'm gonna have to cut another four inch strip anyway. Well, actually I think I'll cut, well, no, I'll cut, two out of this. Definitely have room there for that blue, the, that starry night shimmer to show through. And there you can see how it's starting to take shape. I will finish this all up after we're done and, and have the final example uh, to show you um, later, but I want to move on to the next project so that we can kind of keep moving along. So the next project that we're going to do is going to be the one that's called, um, I called it sunflower picket plaid because I made it um, a couple years ago using the Croptoberfest collection that was available at the time, which was the sunflowers. And here is the one, the sample that is in um, on your handout. It is, I use a sunflower punch and then the various um, papers that were available as part of that um, Croptoberfest. But I'm going to make a springtime version of it using the, um, the National Scrapbook Day. I was really, really hoping to have my new order today because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the um, Blossom Punch, it may not be the name of it, whatever the new flower punch is available, pretty much matches the flowers that are in the NSD collection. And of course, it's gonna coordinate with Blossom, Birds and Blossoms collection as well. And I was really hoping that I would have that and I could put some pretty blossoms on my leafy vine. Um, border. So that's what this is waiting for. Of course, I could also come in. I do have um, various um, elements as part of the stickers um, from either one of the collections to be able to add to this. Um, the crop or the National Scrapbook Day uh, really does coordinate with the um, Birds and Blossoms collection. So you'll be able to really work things together. So for this layout, or this border that we're going to be putting together. On the handout, you can actually see all the little parts you're going to need. Um, we're gonna need a background, a base piece, which in the sample is brown. In my uh, demo today, it's going to be the uh, mushroom paper. We're then going to need kind of a bright poppy paper, or a color that basically contrasts with those, um, uh, the rest of your colors. In my sample, I use the golden, the mustardy golden tonal paper. In this demo today, I'm going to be using the tangerine. We need something that we're going to punch the picket fence with, and I will be using on the opposite side of that periwinkle cornflower is the um, leafy white and green piece. So I'm gonna, this is actually, this is the paper I'm going to punch with the picket fence. And then we need a, another color, a very thin, um, a couple of thin strips. They're just a quarter inch each that we can weave through here on the edge to give this illusion. I call it a plaid, give the illusion of a plaid. I used blue for this collection. Um, over here, I used the purple. It was a nice contrast, but I just want something that definitely you can see. It coordinates, but it stands out. 
And then you will want whatever border you're going to put in the middle. I did two leafy vine because like I said, I plan to use um, the flower punch that's available. You may have another, whatever kind of uh, border works with whatever collection you're using or whatever you need the theme to be. Okay, so this should go together pretty quick. We have a we are going to use um, something that we did before where we are only putting the paper partially into the paper holder. You can actually see that in step one where we're only gonna be pushing, putting it to that middle line again. And here you can say, see that it looks like I pretty much overlapped that black line, um, but you can do it. Um, I would actually probably on this one overlap it a little bit. The reason is you want to make sure you have plenty of room here to be able to weave in this quarter inch strip and then see those additional um, colors behind it. So going all the way over the edge of that strip is gonna work probably well. So when I put this in, I will cover up that black edge all the way. Now you can uh, cut your paper to begin with. This is the paper I'm punching. This is the one I'm starting with. I'm gonna start with this one. In my handout, the paper that I'm punching is supposed to be two and a half inches wide. You can trim it before, you can trim it after. It does not matter. We are not cutting off the edge of the paper. So I'm gonna go ahead and feed this into the middle. Or I'm gonna feed this in. I am, like I mentioned, I am gonna go ahead and cover up that black edge. Move my papers out of the way so I can see a little bit better. I'm gonna cover up that black line on the tray. Problem with covering it up is you gotta like push it back so you can see it and then slowly slide it into place. There we go. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing I, as we did before where I punch down the line, but this time I am gonna punch all the way, all six slots. I'll start at the top and punch down, but here you can see I've got those lines. Now I punched one side, I'm gonna grab my trimmer and I'm gonna cut this at two and a half inches. Two and a half inches. The smaller piece in here, I will line it back up again over the edge of that black line. And then go ahead and punch all the way down the line. So there you can see, we have both sides punched and we just have those notched sides. So that's what's nice about this because one of the things I think that is so distinctive about picket fence is the picket or is the, is the, um, the, the zigzag edge, that pinking edge that just gives you that um, very distinctive look. Sometimes that's great. You can have that just popping out behind a piece of, uh, behind a border. Um, you know, you can minimize, you don't have to show the weaving edge. You know, you just have some little, little triangles popping out. Sometimes you have just a little bit of that popping out. Um, but sometimes you don't want that pinking edge at all. And so what we've done is just by only putting it partially into our paper um, holder, we are just removing, we're not even punching that part. You could punch the entire thing and then just cut it off if you wanted to. But this way we're not wasting paper. We are not having to do anything with our trimmer. We have it just, it's already not even, um, you know, included in the punch itself. Okay, so we have done steps one and two. The next thing we need to do is go ahead, we're gonna cut our pieces that we're going to weave in to the edges here. Um, so I did those um, with the blue cardstock. And I did use a decorative blade to do these. I used the wave blade. You could use whatever one you want. Wave was just, I thought, nice and simple. I've already actually got 
wave started. So I'm gonna go ahead and to do a quarter inch, you're gonna come all the way over to that gray line. This is an, uh, the, where the edge of your mat is. So to the left, to the right of your cut line, if you come all the way to where that gray cutting mat ends, that should is, is a quarter inch. Now, again, if you're using a decorative blade, I've got a peak and I've got a, um, a trough, a, I've got a dip, I've got a peak and a valley. I need to make the determination. Am I taking my peak to that edge to make it a quarter inch? Or am I taking my valley to make it a quarter inch? It really doesn't matter which, if you take the peak to be the quarter inch, it's gonna be a little bit narrower. If you take the valley, it's gonna be a little wider. The biggest thing is I want you to do the same on both strips that you cut. That's the consistency that you need. So I am gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take mine just so that the peak hits that line, that, that edge and go ahead and cut with my wave blade. So my strips are gonna be a little narrower, but the biggest thing, like I said, the biggest thing is that they're consistent. So again, for the second, cause I had already established my cut. So I only had to do one more with that um, to get the wave on both sides. If you're just starting out, you're gonna to have to establish your wave or your decorative edge and then cut again for this other side. Then with your, to make the second piece, you only have to cut a third time. And I'm just taking it to get my peak of my wave and then cutting. So my pieces should be, we want them to look, when you visually look at them, you want them to look consistent. They're off here to the side. They look good. One's a tiny bit thicker than the other, but it's not a big deal. They just are fairly consistent. All right, so we will want to weave these in to our edge here. And I wanna make sure that the, my bottom edge is under here. So I'm gonna start on the under and come up and I am just going to weave in and out. I do find that I have to hold, you wanna hold it in place so that the pieces don't flop, slide out. It's a downside when you have these notches and versus the uh, full slots where they can't really slide out at the bottom. And just keep weaving all the way up, up and down. You can, you don't have to go over and under every one. You could adjust, but I, for this particular piece, over and under on every one works out fine. And there's the first one. Just tuck it in all the way to the inside edge for now. We'll adjust it in a minute. We just don't want it falling out as you're weaving the other side. Go ahead and tuck it all the way in. And then you'll repeat on the other side, that second woven piece. Let's see, Belinda said she's never used her picket fence before. Are there any others out there that had ever used theirs? I think, you know, challenge comes into is that we, um, it's been around for so long that we don't see it quite as frequently in things like the creative memories blog projects. Um, it certainly does. I do see it in samples people post in the, uh, virtual crop group and things like that, but I don't, I, there's so many other cartridges out there that I don't feel that it's one that really is grabbed a whole lot. Um, but hopefully this will inspire some of you maybe to try it in some, uh, new ways. So the, and, um, what I will also do is I, I know Tess and I have, we have used picket fence in our, uh, power hours before I will go back and, um, highlight some power hours that have picket fence options in there. Um, they're of course always made, um, when we do things like power hour, we always are you know talking about, you can use an edge style versus or whatever. So some of them you can sub out and that's what people do is they'll sub a different uh, border maker cartridge in there. But there's a couple of them that specifically use picket fence, I think in a way that is um, fun and unique. And I would encourage you to actually use picket fence when you make that layout. Um, so here we go. We got our, those are woven in there. So next up is where you're gonna to wanna to have that contrasting color that comes underneath it. In my example here, it is the golden mustard color. It's two and three eighths inches wide. And 
I am going to cut the tangerine and there you can see that tangerine. Well, it's kind of far away on the screen, but it does pop through for sure. This is an area where tangerine being the vibrant color that it is, is a good thing. I want to put my straight blade back in. I do not want this to be a decorative edge. I want it to be straight and I'm going to cut it in two and three eighths inches. This is slightly narrower than our uh, previously punched piece because I want these little edges to actually stick out beyond the, uh, the, uh, the tangerine cardstock. So two and three eighths inch. Line that up. Now to put these together, this is gonna sit on top and be centered. And you may not be able to see it, but I can definitely see it here. Those edges of this top piece stick out beyond my tangerine. So to adhere everything together, one of the things I do wanna do is I am gonna just push my blue quarter inch strip. I wanna to try to center it on my, in here. So I'm trying to center it. Let's see if I, within here. So like that piece right there, not quite centered. I want to have it a little more centered. Now, of course, this can always be delightful trying to center it all the way down. And actually what we're going to do, I'm going to flip this over, grab my silicone mat, and I'm going to apply some repositionable adhesive on the back. Here you are getting to see what the back side looks at, like with that darker, the, the periwinkle cone flower, um, that would be a fun option too, if you didn't like the white. So the, the good thing about that is you can play with either side and not necessarily have to do, um, <laughs> redo anything. The, the weaving part is, and the cutting is all the same. Anyway, I am going to use the lighter side. So I have matching borders on this edge. We're going to go ahead and apply some repositionable adhesive. So what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to get my blue piece and then lined up. It's hard for you to see because my cutting mat or my silicone mat is also dark blue. And then I'm going to run some adhesive, some repo adhesive down this. And what that's going to do is help everything stick to the, um, the tangerine. I'm going to do the same at the top. I'm moving that cutting that blue edge over and running that repo adhesive down this piece. I will be able to still make some adjustments um, with that as I slide things along, um, but that should get everything stuck. Now, I really am only worried about adjusting that thin blue strip. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave my repo adhesive where it is there, but in this middle section, I am gonna go ahead and attach some regular adhesive so that I know everything's gonna stick really nicely to that tangerine. Now this all gets centered. So I want to be able to make sure that my edge of the punched paper is, um, sticks out from either side of the tangerine. So as I lay this down, I am going to make sure that I can see both on both sides that that is edges are sticking out. Now, before I start really pushing down on my blue area, so my middle, I can go ahead and I can run my finger down the middle. My tangerine is stuck now to my punch piece. It's these little, these blue, this blue strip that I kind of want to try to get centered back in here. So as I get happy with where it is, I'm going to go ahead and put some pressure and hopefully that repo adhesive will get itself stuck into place. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You just want it to not be obvious in some areas there's gaps bigger than others. There we go. Okay, so there I've got it all together. You can see those pieces stick out and then my blue pieces is centered in there as, as best possible. Okay, so next up we need to go ahead and we're gonna add that backing piece. So in my sample um, is the brown where it says two and three quarters. Now I, when I did this first one, 
I really wasn't too concerned about having a lot of the brown stick out because it was just brown cardstock. It didn't have a pattern, didn't have anything else with it. I did cut it with the Victorian blade, so it was a little bit more decorative on that, but it's I cut it at two and three quarter inch because that was the size that worked well. This one, this particular border, I cut the backing piece a little bit wider. I cut it at three inches and I used the wave blade again. The reason I did that is because I had more color, more interest in the pattern that I wanted to show through. I wanted to bring in all those colors, the tangerine, the green, um, the light blue in there. I wanted those to stick out. So what I did is I cut it three inches. I gave myself a little bit more width to it so that we could see those pretty colors. Now for this particular one, because I have a paper that is directional, meaning I have tops to these mushrooms. This is where you have to think about your paper. Are you gonna use this as a vertical border or as a horizontal border? To be completely honest, there's not a whole lot of these. You can kind of tell where the tops and the mushrooms are, but if I really needed this to be a vertical border, that's fine. If I wanted to rotate it to be horizontal, that's fine too. There's not enough of the pattern, I think, to make it super obvious that this back piece has a pattern to it but you might wanna keep that in mind um, depending on how you plan to use your border. So again, I want to use the wave blade here. This is the piece I already used to make my previous one. So it does have a wave edge already cut. You will want to establish your wave edge if you have not or whatever decorative blade you're going to use. You could use straight, it doesn't have to be decorative. And then I'm gonna go ahead, I've got my decorative edge on this side. I'm gonna come over here to three. It does, This one, it doesn't really matter too much whether I'm valley or trough on that one or peak or valley on that wave. I just want it to be consistent all the way down the line. Cut again. And then all we're gonna do here is this gets mounted on in the middle so that we have about a quarter of an inch sticking out from the top and the bottom. I'll use regular adhesive for this. And then in the middle, you're simply going to apply whatever border or design you want down the middle. The spacing works well for our regular border punches. You have a bit of a space here if you want to come in with the blue and white. I originally used a uh, leafy vine. Um, if you have, if you're doing it with the National Scrapbook Day, this might be a spot to put in some of those mushroom punches or the the forest mushroom border punch. There, you could always layer in stickers. Um, in here, laser cut borders, however you want to do it so it works out well for you. As I mentioned before, I used Leafy Vine. I did it in two different colors. I punched one with the Parakeet Shimmer and then I punched one out of, I think this is moss. I knew what it was. Oh, it's Marsh Green, pardon me. It's from a cardstock buffet from a while ago. I tried this with the um, Kelly Green, which is part of the NSD um, cardstock sampler pack, but it was feeling a little too vibrant for me. I don't know, I just wasn't quite grooving with it. Um, and so I picked out these colors because I have lots of colors. How I decided that was I grabbed my cardstock swatch, hopefully you've had a chance to put one of these together and just kind of went through it to see what do I like. Um, and I also grabbed my you know, you may have like me where you do the project folders and you put all of your scraps. This is a great time to go through the scraps, right? Like why would you, don't punch a brand new sheet. Look through your scraps, see what you have. So I did two pieces there. And the other thing I wanna talk about, I do not know whether you'll be able to see it or not, but Leafy Vine, um, because I just used cardstock, I didn't really have a texture. There's, you know, I didn't have a designer paper or a total paper that had some texture built into it. I actually, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I actually took, maybe if I bring it up there, you can see a little bit. You see what I did? I used my multi-purpose tool and I drew little veins on the leaves. So that may be an option for you. Give it a little bit of uh, texture to it. Um, I could probably be a little more elaborate with those if I wanted to, but um, I just like that little bit. Now I am still waiting for UPS to show up with my new Blossom Punch. I can't remember the exact name of it. I'm so sorry. It's probably got, it's came out with Birds and Blossoms and it, um, I think it's going to look really nice on here. Um, and that's kind of why I've, I've set it up 
I'm waiting for my flowers to bloom. Um, and so once those show up, I will go ahead and punch some in scraps of paper that coordinate with this, maybe grab some of the tangerine or other colors, uh, maybe that light blue, um, light blue or the uh, shimmer paper might look really nice too. So I'll grab some of those and maybe put a little bouquet of flowers on there. All right, so that is the second project, which is our sunflower picket plaid. Now, the next one I'm going to show you to me is probably one of my favorite um, things to do with picket fence. Um, we are going to do what I call picket panels. And I probably made the most boring picket panel ever because I, as I mentioned, I was trying to use the NSD papers and um, this is a paper out of the accessory pack that's available as the customer bundle. If you find that you love that accessory pack and you need more of it, you need to talk to your advisor. It's an advisor exclusive. Your advisor can hook you up with more um, uh, sets of that accessory paper pack, but it does have this lovely wood tone in there or the wood grain. And I thought, you know, it's just kind of fun. Instead of just having a big chunk of this, um, of the wood grain, maybe you create yourself a picket paneling. And so I'm going to show you how to do it. It is going to be, um, the, I don't know. I think it's just pretty fun to do. Um, Mary helped me out. It's, it's called the fresh flower punch with the one that I called Blossom, because we've had other Blossoms, but it's called the Fresh Flower Punch. So when that shows up, I'll add it to my previous one. So pick a panel. I do have to apologize for the two-page handout for this, but this was one of my earlier um, handouts that I made. I shared this in my customer group a few years ago, and I used larger photos, and I've shrunk things down now. So it's two pages. I did not want to redo the handout. So we are going to start off with some cardstock. And I think cardstock works really well for this because we want these panel, like we want the grid to be a little bit more understated. We do not, it's, it's pieced together. Um, and so we don't want to worry about patterns matching up and so forth. So I would recommend using cardstock for this. And then you can pick a pattern paper that you'll do as part of your weave. When this, I did this Emerald Gemstone was the, uh, uh, newest collection or one of the collections available. And you can see that the two papers that I chose were really stunning in there. Um, just more of a, um, nothing with too much of a pattern to it, just really beautifully colored and so forth. But at the same time, I did it with what's relatively tonal wood grain paper. So it really just depends on the look you want to go for, but you're going to need a decorative paper and you're going to need some cardstock. Okay. So to get started, we are going to go ahead and punch our borders. We're going to go ahead and um, we'll punch we'll punch three to get going. But you can see here if you want to do it with a two panel versus a three panel, it you know it all goes together the same way. A three panel does get to be a little wide. It is a full three inches, whereas a two panel is going to be closer to two inches wide. So some people maybe don't want as wide of a border. Maybe you want something a little narrower. That's something to keep in mind as well. It is obviously easy to add a panel if you need to. All right. So we'll start off with step one and we are going to punch. I'm starting off with a fresh sheet of hot fudge cardstock. Line this up. I'm going flush to that edge of the paper tray, folding it back, and we'll go ahead and give a punch. All right, there we go. We've punched all the way down. And now here's my little trick. I'm gonna slide, turn this around, and I'm gonna punch the other side because I need two, I need one, I need three. Rather, I'm in the punching groove right now. Rather than moving things out of the way and trimming, punching, then trimming, I'm gonna punch both sides. And then I'll trim two, and then I'll have one last one to punch and trim. Now, when you're using your trimmer on this, you're gonna wanna take, you see this inside edge of my, um, the punched border, the inside edge, right? With the, where that slot ends on the left side, that is the side you're going to line up at that quarter inch mark. And remember that quarter inch mark is where the edge of the gray mat is to the right of your cut line. So right here is my quarter inch. So I'm going to bring my, the bottom of that slot all the way to that quarter inch. 
I see that I have my wave blade in there. So if you've used a decorative blade last, you gotta switch back over to your straight blade. And trim. And you're gonna need three pieces like this. So I'll do one more. our third border and then we're going to need to go ahead and we are going to want to cut some 5 8 inch strips from our designer paper so after I cut this I'm going to grab that designer paper and I'm going to cut three 5 8 inch strips so there's my picket fence pieces but quickly before I put away my cart my piece of paper here I need two I need two quarter inch strips of my, whatever color I punched my uh, piece in here. So two quarter inch strips. So there's one and I'll need a second one. I think in my sample, I didn't put my second strip on, but it's good to have the second strip. Set that aside. Oh, nope, I set it aside and I need it back. I'm gonna come over here to my wood grain paper. And you can obviously use whatever you want. Um, I am gonna come in here at um, 5 eighths of an inch is where I need to trim. Five eighths is kind of the magical number for the picket fence. I would actually, if you have a Sharpie that you can write on your picket fence with, I would actually write on there five eighths inch. And then you just know that's the, the, what you weave. Um, that's the weaving. Obviously when we fold and punch, we alter that. But if you're just using picket, punch in, picket fence in the normal manner, you're going to, um, it's gonna be five eighths inch. All right, so I've got those three panels that I can weave. And um, maybe this time I do this edge, this, this is on the back side. Let me look at these. Do I think I could use, oh, I was thinking maybe I would use um, this other side, but I really don't like the way these patterns turned out. If I if I had been able to get all of them to look like this, I may have used it, but these two are very off center. So you can see they're just going to look a little awkward. So I'm going to stick with my wood grain pieces. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to start weaving. Now we always want to make sure that our bottom edge is, cover, is covered. So we're going to start from under and come up. And then what you can do is you're going to alternate or alter your weaving pattern. You're not going to go in and out, in and out, in and out. You're going to go like maybe come up and skip one slot, then go under, come right back up. And maybe you're going to skip two slots and just, you know, find, find a pattern that works for you. Um, the first one doesn't matter so much just because um, it's your other pattern, the other pieces that you want to make sure they stagger after you make your first one. So you can see here, I skipped one there. I skipped two. I didn't skip any there. I've got it more narrow than here. I skipped two again. This one, I'm going to skip three. The thing to do is you want to make sure when you get to the top that you end by going under. So as I get up here, I'm going to just go under, come back up, and end by going under. That's the biggest thing you wanna just make sure you do is you end by going under. So there's my first set here, done. 
Now, when I do my next piece, I do have to keep in mind where did I, you know, start because I do not want my unders to line up with each other. So this first one I skipped, I did where I skipped one there. I'm probably going to skip two. So what I've done is see when I line these up, I can see that they're staggered. That's what I'm looking for. I do not want these to line up. So then I can come here and I think what I'm gonna have to do is I'm just gonna do a big leap here, I think. And I'm gonna have to go all the way up. Well, I can do a little one. I'll do a little one, then I'll do a big one. I don't wanna do a big one right away. And then I'll do a big one. The weaving will be adjustable. So if you find that you do, as you after you put things together, you will be able to go back and fix it. That's what I had to do when I made my wood sample. The one I worked on it yesterday is because I did. I, I don't know I, what I was thinking. I thought I had it better, but I didn't. And I had to adjust that. There we go. So these will work fine. None of my panels line up. Okay, so that's that's my goal here. None of these cross sections line up. So now I got one more to do. One thing you're gonna have available as we're doing our final weaving thing here is if you have the uh, adhesive pen, you're gonna to wanna to have that available. line just in figuring out just keep checking where i need to be Okay, just looking at everything and making sure that none of the panels, see that none of them line up. So yay, I did it right. Okay, so now when it comes time to putting this together, you have a couple of options. And I talk about those in like step six, where you can actually use it where you show the pinking sides. With the, the, so the, the, the peaks of the fence show through. And there you have a little bit of... Um, some texture that kind of shows through. And that actually with this wood grain one actually would be a potential option. Let me show you. See how the picket fence there, you can kind of see it towards the top if I angle this right. You can see how those that pinking edge shows there as some texture, right? Okay, but if you don't want that, if you want the sleek look, right? You want the sleek look. What you're going to do is you're going to go ahead, separate your picket fences. You're going to need one, if not two of your borders, your, your quarter inch strips. And we're actually going to go ahead and take our adhesive pen and you're going to dot all of the tips. You're going to put a little bit of adhesive on each one of these tips. Now you could do this with a repo um, adhesive um, I just think it's super easy to do it with the, um, the dual tip pen. I made the mistake. I should have started on the other side over here. I'm right-handed and I was going to just be dragging my hand through the glue. So I just flipped it around and I am just putting a little bit of adhesive, a dot on each one of those, the tips of the fence. And I'm going to wait, here's the thing, if, if you are not familiar with adhesive pen, this is like so fantastic, right? I don't use it a ton. 
Um, but when I need it is when I need it. The trick to the adhesive tip pen is to let it, I don't want to say dry, but you are letting it dry. It comes out kind of that creamy blue color. It will dry clear, but it remains tacky. The biggest thing about that is if I were to, it, it remains tacky, but when you uh, put things together, it won't spread and bleed out. All right. If I were to start assembling this while it's still that creamy blue color, that the adhesive is just gonna spread. It's gonna come out from underneath my paper. It just kind of makes a little bit of a mess. By waiting for it to dry, it will dry clear. It remains tacky, but then it won't spread. So if you are ever doing fine detail work with like maybe really tiny letters or other little things where this adhesive pen is gonna be your best friend, dot it on, move it on however you want, but let it dry clear before you adhere it. I promise you it remains tacky. Okay. So, um, the reality is, is it's going to take a few minutes. This is usually where I get up, go refill my cup. i set it to the side, come back to it. Um, my, the first one I did, which is this line over here is starting to get tacky. Um, over here, it's not quite, I'm going to rotate this back around and start assembling it a little bit. I think I am tacky enough over here to keep this video going. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cap my fence. So this is my, this is my most right um, piece. I'm going to go ahead, my quarter inch strip, I'm going to lay it on. I'm going to butt it right up against the edge of that paper that I wove through. Come down at the bottom and it's going to cap the, fe the, the fence. We're going to get rid of those pinking edges. All right. So that's what I've done. I've capped those edges. You can't see the pinking edges anymore. I can't just cut the pinking edges off because then, well, it doesn't work. Um, I need to leave them on. They go ahead and provide that support for that cap. Then what I do is I use the piece from before and that becomes the cap of the next set of fences or the next top of the fence of those, the pinking pieces that I don't want to show through the tops of the fence. And then if this would be my two panel, if I only need two panels, I mean that right there to me, I don't know. I love it. It's this. there's actually, I wish I, you, uh, there's a place uh, down. If you ever go down to, if you're in Seattle and you ever go down to the Seattle center, you go to Mopop, you go to the space needle. There is actually a sculpture that is things like this that are just kind of stuck up and, you know, like, like a fence. And I've done my kids senior pictures down there. And that's what it makes me think of with these tonal Browns in there. Anyway, um, a side note is I'm waiting for my adhesive just to dry a little bit more. I would give this more time if um, I wasn't doing this as part of a video and I'm going to cap it and do the third panel. So there we have all three panels. Now, the one thing to note on this, why I had you cut a second one, um, some, depending on how particular you are, you will always see that little bit of where the, you know, the paper, you can look here, you can see, well, maybe see how we have these edges. And then on this side here, we just don't have that same type of thing. One of the things you can do if you want, you could come in and add another piece over here, which just gives that additional illusion for um, the, the things, I guess, but you don't have to. Um, you can certainly just leave it. I mean, there's it doesn't add anything except for just the illusion of how the paper is layered. Um, so you can leave it off if you don't want to include it on there. All right, so that is our picket panel. And um, hopefully you guys enjoy and find ways to utilize these layouts uh, or these borders or these techniques. Um, so Darlene is coming. It does look a lot like the Building Bricks Border Punch. Um, I, that definitely, that they, I was so excited when they came out with that brick punch because I just think it's such, so, um, well, to be fair, it's not botanical or floral. And so I always love those geometric type um, patterns um, like as such, because I just need that kind of stuff to use for my layouts, uh, probably more so than 
uh, florals and botanicals, just because that's how my life is, right? Um, just a little bit more, not quite as many floral options, or I don't need as many floral things. They're always beautiful and fun to play with. Uh, so that's what I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for joining. Hopefully you enjoyed putting together um, things with the picket fence, a couple different or three different options there to play around with. Um, I will, I'm going to get this all ready to go. So you guys, if you came in partway through and you missed part of it, you can go back and watch the beginning. I'll update the blog post. I do uh, plan to, I need to go and find which months they were that Tessa and I have used picket fence in various ways in our uh, power hour layouts. So there might be some options in there for you to give uh, picket fence a second look. Um, so, uh, I think that's all I've got for you today. Uh, thanks for joining me. Just the quick reminder, there is free shipping right now with creative memories. I don't know if there's happens to be any of you out there that don't have the border maker system. You get free shipping with an $80 order. Uh, the border maker system, I think is something like 35. Um, so you've got a great start. You can pick up some Croptober or national scrapbook day stuff. Tessa and I do have our national scrap day, national scrapbook day project workshop coming up. Um, March 21st. That's a free workshop. We're putting together everything from the uh, project recipe into the project booklet. So that'll be fun. Um, and I'm trying to think what else is coming up. We do, um, Elizabeth is talking about, she's got her polka dot BMC organizer. I have my downstairs. I have got to get it out and put it together. I'm making a mess. Um, and, uh, and you see how it works. I'm super excited. They came out with that type of a thing. It's, it's really, I think a pretty neat concept and it'll be a lot of fun to incorporate into your storage options. Um, not much else going on right now. You saw, we have the new collections out, the free shipping national scrapbook day. Um, I will be back next week with a project. I do not anticipate having any, I, I think a month of, month of March, I will be every week. However, we get into April and it gets a little, uh, heavy cavy just because I've got some travel plans in April. that are going to make it hard to do weekly scrapbook lives. Hey, but that's an April problem. And we're still trying to wrap up February. So hopefully everybody has fun leap day plans. That's tomorrow. Very, very exciting. Um, and, um, so forth. So, all right. Thanks for joining me today. I will have uh, photos for you guys to, sh to share after a little bit here and get the video loaded for you. Thanks so much for watching.